so uh, yes, I don't know if I have deep insights, but I'll tell you what I'm thinking about. And the whole point of this talk is to bounce an idea against the community and really use the chat. Criticism, good or bad, is really welcome. I want to see your thoughts on the things that I'm talking about, because um, that's the whole point for me. Uh, the, as I said, new research area for me, really interesting to see what you're thinking about my ideas. Um, so where do I, where does this idea come from? Well, basically, I think everybody has heard about the Internet of Things, sensors are going everywhere. This is a graph I pulled from the Internet about how many sensors are out there and getting out there as we speak. Uh, there's even worse predictions about trillions of sensors. I don't even know if we have the materials to make trillions of sensors on this planet, but hey, that's what people are thinking. Um, but from my industrial experience, before I get back to academia, I realized that these little devices are eh, not the best kind of systems we can be putting out there. And I'll get to that in a second. We're making them more and more um, capability buffed up. You know, they have more bigger, hard, harder working CPUs, um, bigger memories. Some of them even come with GPUs and loads of you know, peripheral support. Um, but um, we're still kind of just flushing all this data up all the way to the cloud. And well, there's applications where we want to use these devices, but maybe the cloud isn't the way forward because uh, there's not enough or there's not enough stable internet connection. So latency becomes a horrible problem to face when the networking is intermittent. Um, the cloud isn't necessarily the priviest, but there's a secure, the most secure and the most private way to share data about things like medical device applications, for example. Um, these devices tend to sometimes send dirty or unclean data up um, stream all the way to the cloud, and we don't know about it until it's kind of too late. And then as we are putting more and more of these IoT devices out there, demand for cloud uh, services is gonna reach beyond what the cloud, the existing cloud can um, cater for. Um, so there's a clear kind of direction in the research community of moving machine learning closer to the edge. And I'll explain what that is. So uh, if you think of today's IoT landscape, we've got sensors down kind of at the one end and all these arrows show data flowing upstream. Um, these kind of devices at the very kind of end um, tend to be written in languages like C or MicroPython if you're lucky. But there's also around 600 other technologies out there that people are using to program IoT devices. Now, uh, in recent years, people have started looking at, well, can we introduce this extra layer, this uh, edge, edge nodes, edge servers that can do some processing um, of this data and kind of minimize the flow that keeps going upstream. Um, and uh, these devices can be maybe a, a smaller server, maybe your laptop, um, maybe even your network router, so here we start seeing even more technologies being put into the mix. Um, then you've got your infrastructure, like your internet, uh, your 5G antennas and 4G antennas that could cater as things that process data as well. Um, so you start seeing kind of all these layers with all these different technologies coming together. Finally, you've got the cloud and then other technologies for user interfaces and web apps and mobile apps coming together. Now, that's what you would call a full stack for an IoT application. And I really hate the term full stack developer. It's like you're paying one person to do a team's job. But hey, you know, <laughs> that's a different topic for a different day. Um, Erlang is gaining traction in this space. We saw some really nice talks earlier on about this, but nerves and other projects going on in this space. And there's a few people that have seen the value in doing it, um, but we, we could do more. And I believe that as we're going to the future, we'll see systems coming up that will have kind of a miniature of this whole stack in every little device. So every device would be expected to be doing some data crunching, some machine learning processing, 
uh, you know, building on knowledge locally of its environment and its context and sharing that knowledge across with its neighbors. So yeah, edge computing may be solving some problems because you're just adding a little cloud before the big cloud. Okay, um, but at the same time, um, just bringing machine learning closer to the edge isn't as simple. I mean, um, how resilient or reliable are these components that feed into this edge node? How do you um, know you can trust the data that are coming in to make usable inference over that data? Um, another thing that tends to happen a lot in IoT devices is that any hardware or software failure really translates to the loss of data uh, or even worse, corrupted data getting into your uh, data pipeline. And then another problem is as you make that machine learning world smaller, more localized, you by nature have less data to go by. I mean, we all maybe have heard that machine learning works on big data sets. So making the data set smaller, you're introducing a problem, right? You're, you're, you're trying to learn something about the world with less data points to learn on. And at that point of my career, that was a couple of years ago, I was in a talk uh, that Boyd from Cry10 was giving at Glasgow Caledonian University. And he was kind of reiterating the same problems that I was finding. And I thought, wow, another person relates to how I feel. And then his solution was, um, let's use Erlang. I mean, it's built for reliability. It's by default designed to be distributed. So why don't we take something that works somewhere else and apply it to IoT? Um, and I thought, what a great idea. That's brilliant. Let's do that. And then I realized, well, there's problems. <laughs> so um, yeah, that would be brilliant if we can make new resilient IoT stacks. I'd love that. I mean, I used to be the person, the man in the van that was going out to factories to fix that one sensor that was sending me rubbish data. It's a pain. You would don't want to do that if we're sending trillions of IoT devices out there. And also, we don't want to spend a decade developing the perfect C code that does, you know, the perfect little processing of data streams and, and you know, that, that's, we don't have that time, you know, that the industry moves too fast. We need to improve development time too. And then people started talking about federated learning. That is one little IoT device talking to another little IoT device and they kind of share their knowledge about their context and it contributes to their machine, their, their global machine learning view of the world. So how, how can you tell, if you can't trust your own data, how can you tell that you can trust the data from someone else and they are sending it to you over a reliable kind of protocol? Ah, Erlang obviously would work in this situation, right? It's meant to be about distribution between different nodes, right? So, okay, they are physically remote, even better, but um, we could make sure using this environment that everything that comes in from these federated little IoT devices is reliable and we can use it and we can trust it. Cool, but IoT devices are tiny. They have little battery power, maybe a small memory um, availability to them, maybe a, a very small processor. You know, if you have a collar on a cow that you want to change the battery of every 10 years, you really cannot be doing too much processing on that device or, you know, people would have to go and change batteries every second day. That's not useful to anyone. So physical constraints impose kind of a problem and we need to look at it as an optimization type of problem now. But ultimately our goal is to disassociate failures from the effect they have on data. And so we sat down with Boyd and also uh, Jose from Dasbit and we wrote this proposal that we submitted uh, maybe six months ago uh, here in the UK for funding that looks at how we could possibly put this together. So what we proposed is let's take the NERVS operating system that allows us to run Erlang. Let's uh, make this new library that I call Mili, but you can call it whatever you want. It's not made yet. It's an imaginary thing. <laughs> Um, and in this library, let's create 
uh, the, the software we need uh, to do context awareness. And by that, I mean, we know uh, for in, in this example, we have this vibrating machinery um, that a user can use for a certain period of time. And then we need to tell the user to stop using it or they'll get a disease called white finger. And there's a regulation for that. So we can, uh, you know, you know, you all know what it's like when we ask people to adhere to regulation. Uh, why don't we make software do it for us? Uh, so let's put a sensor on that vibrating machinery that tells us how, mo how long the machinery is vibrating for. It's actually running. Let's identify the user that touches that thing and just measure the time, you know, and then stop the machine when the user has to change. Don't let that same user touch that machine again until that period of time has passed. Sounds simple. But what does it require? It requires the software to know about the context, you know, when, who is the user, identify uniquely the different users, identify the operating condition of the machine, identify that the sensor is actually sending correct data, it's actually vibrating, it's not just reading rubbish. Um, identify sudden changes to the data stream that may mean that the, there's a hardware failure in the sensor that we don't want to pick up. And then once you've cleaned all that, you know your sensor is healthy and you've checked it, feed that clean data into this node that you wrote in Erlang again, and it's a machine learning node um, to predict, you know, um, or follow up on the correct use of this machine, feed all that back uh, to the control unit of the vibrating machinery. Sounds simple like an idea, but hey. <laughs> if all the world, the world was that simple. Um, taking a machine learning algorithm and make it run on a small device efficiently isn't an obvious or trivial task. You know, uh, you need to decide when uh, you can stop training or retraining that algorithm to optimize between power, budget, and accuracy. So it's a mathematical kind of problem. Um, but obviously, uh, you could use your neighbors if you have an edge node, if you have a mobile phone, anything other than that little sensor there, you could use as a remote node that can do some data crunching for you. Um, and I kind of talked about all the other challenges and opportunities in my earlier slide, but I'll, I'll, uh, I thought it's nice to kind of put it back in context. Um, here, that if we're co-locating the data source with the processing of that data, by default, we're improving privacy. We never send this private data of that user's use of the machine up to the cloud. So his uh, healthcare provider or insurer cannot go later and check, did you actually not use that machine correctly? And that's why you've got that condition that we're not going to pay for, um, you know? So we're keeping private and important information away from sources that could be used. I mean, you know how Facebook uses your data. You, do you really trust somebody in the cloud with your private data that you may or may not sell to someone like your health insurance company? That's kind of a question. Okay, so where are we with this? Um, ha has it worked? Can it work? Uh, so we started kind of working in this day. I think I skipped a slide. Eh? No, sorry. There we go. I skipped the slide. Um, I think the first reaction I had from people that know Erlang and Elixir was, well, what, numerical calculations in Erlang that, mm, you know, that doesn't happen. How, how are we going to do this? And that's when I met Jose from uh, Daspit doing numerical elixir, advertisement banner, sorry. Um, so uh, they have developed this library that can do tensors. And if you don't know what a tensor is, uh, this is a really nice um, KD Nuggets uh, article called What the is a tensor? And you can read it at your own time. It basically is what the picture says. It's a way to group um, data together. And it's useful because that's how neural networks work based on tensors. So uh, this library comes with a set of really useful um, 
features. Um, you can have typed multidimensional tensors. That means that you can choose if your data is integer of 32 bits or 64 bits, depending on your architecture. Uh, you can name your tensors, which means you can connect your data to the label of the feature you're talking about. It's easier to make sense of your own code this way. Um, and it has some of the other nice features like um, automatic uh, differentiation and uh, numerical definitions for uh, compilation on different backends, basically. So you can have CPU targets, GPU targets, <sighs> compile ahead of time, compile just in time, like I did these slides for you today. Um, and basically, uh, the idea is that you can also use this library to do tensor operations. This is obviously not all the way to neural networks. Uh, it's just uh, it shows that we can do numerical things in Erlang reliably. Wow. Um, and my team has started working in this uh, direction to use uh, uh, the NX library to build neural networks and to see whether we can make it federated. So whether, whether we can use these devices to talk to each other and share their knowledge. Coco is somewhere in the audience. Thank you, Coco, for your hard work. And he's using um, these uh, Raspberry Pi cars to try and uh, process images from those not very good cameras, but enough to detect objects and then uh, see whether they can talk to each other and uh, build an image of you know, the reality, do some kind of um, collaborative task together. For now, our target is to see whether we can do autonomous driving of these vehicles in a collaborative way. We, I'm hoping we can do it in Cure Erlang, but for now we're using PyTorch as the backend because it's a bit faster. Mm. Um, so some results of what's been done so far. So we even managed to have NERS uh, train uh, on a Raspberry Pi Zero and uh, train a neural network in about 120 seconds per epoch eating minimal power. I mean, for me, that's very impressive already. Um, it's obviously not um, useful if you want to keep retraining that neural network all the time. But I mean, it can be done. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a starting step in the right direction. And then we've done it also on the Raspberry Pi 4 board um, with obviously better times. So it took about 12 seconds to do the whole training of the whole model and then being able to infer objects. Um, and that was a, a celebration moment for Coco, as you can see in his Twitter feed there. Um, we all, I'm very excited about this work. Um, so, okay, we kind of are there. We have something that can do neural networks. Why do I even need to talk about this, right? Uh, it's done. Uh, not quite yet. I mean, um, yes, it's a first step in the right direction. We need to make it faster. We need to make it more efficient. We need to make sure we can run it on loads of smaller devices. And I'm really hoping we can use uh, GRISP2 to, to see it working on uh, actual embedded devices in the near future. I mean, we're waiting for the delivery. Um, and um, the other thing is neural networks is the one very commonly used machine learning or AI, if you like, um, algorithm technology approach, whatever you want to call it. But there's much more, and some of them may be more appropriate for smaller devices because they require less time and less power um, by default. The algorithm is less complicated, that, simple as that. Uh, support vector machines may be one of them. Uh, K-means uh, is a clustering algorithm that also is one of them. Um, K-nearest neighbors uh, is kind of an unsupervised approach that you don't need to even tell your system anything about your data. You just let it run and let it do its thing and it can converge somewhere, sometimes somewhere surprisingly that you didn't know about. Um, and then there's loads of other things like uh, decision trees and by Asian models to predict the future and that kind of thing. So there's a vast amount of engineering work to be done, but it's not just about engineering software. It's also about finding that optimization, that balance between what do we sacrifice in terms of accuracy, in terms of what the algorithm does, 
how can we make um, the math work for us and instead of our device working hard to solve the math, yeah? So uh, there's a bit of, of work to be done in the background to figure out how we can really port these things um, on smaller devices effectively. Um, and I think that was my talk for today. I hope it was short and sweet for the last talk of the day. <laughs> and uh, I was really, really hoping for your ideas and questions. So fire ahead. I'm trying to juggle between things and see the chat. <laughs> if there's anything there, I mean. Yeah, please, if, uh, if anyone has any questions, um, uh, feel free to shoot them on Wovo. Yeah, any comments, any thoughts, any ideas, anything? Doesn't have to be a question. I had one question around the the performance of NX um, uh, uh, that came up in, in in the last Q and A from the last talk as well, um, and it seems to be uh, something that very everyone's very interested in. Um, was there orders of magnitude uh, uh, of difference there, or? So you mean when I said PyTorch is faster, <laughs> you know, the back end. Um, I think that uh, for the um, Raspberry Pi 4 board, it was uh, feasible within, um, you know, smaller difference between PyTorch and actually, let me pull back that. It wasn't PyTorch that, that compiled and um, trained in 12 seconds. It was the libtorch that we used as a backend for the Raspberry Pi 4. So for the bigger board, it was doing all right. But then for, uh, for Raspberry Pi 0, it was taking too long to record. So we abandoned. <laughs> so that, that, that tells you something. Uh, so Coco, do you want to answer that? I unmute if you can. You're still muted. Sorry. I don't know if he can unmute himself. Well, okay, okay. No, no, I can unmute myself. Yeah. So, um, for the new port, uh, it's like, um, yes, it's currently it's like one magnitude faster than pure elixir, but, um, yeah, but depends on your um target because, uh, new port is a large library and it takes like near 100 megabytes. So if your uh, target devices is not capable of um, put all the uh, all the libraries in on that uh, device, then well, you have to uh, use uh, Elixir. So that depends on your uh, use case. Uh, if you can use the faster libraries, then well, why not use the faster one? Because, uh, but, uh, but however, um, in the was right in C++, so you have to consider um, the, the the data, uh, uh, the you know if the something runs in the C++ part, then it's hard to it's hard for you to debug your code. And if you want the safety part, then Elixir is the way to go. Yeah, that's all. Awesome, thank you. Um, it looks like we got a few more questions coming in um, uh, uh, in Wovo. Um, this one is from uh, Clio. Um, there are a few startups trying to do AI on edge chips. Did that come up in your research? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, um, I think the whole idea came through co with, from conversations with Boyd, who is actually in the audience. Hi, Boyd. Uh, so, yes, I'm very acutely aware of the fact. Um, and the thing is, I think this could be a, a useful tool for, for not just for research, but for, for everybody. Um, and that's the, the whole idea of the, the proposal was to make this an open uh, software so people can use it for whatever the, go the goals are that they want to reach out for. Um, my uh, goal would be to look at, as I said, federated learning as the next step. How, how can we go beyond what's happening in one device and just bring all the devices together and let them um, contribute 
to their uh, local knowledge of the world, to a global kind of model of the world around them. Um, but that, that's more kind of a research theme. The library can be used then from everybody. I hope we are funded. We had really good feedback last week. So I'm, I'm just, you know, hanging in there waiting for it. <laughs> Uh, another question uh, that has come through, uh, is there a paper or repository describing your work here so far? I'm interested in better understanding the uh, experiment with the cars. That is from Kale. I think Coco has started putting a repository together. Uh, don't know if we can uh, put that in the chat, but it was on my slide too. So if the video was captured and you can read it later, you can find it there. But I can, I can put that in the answers later if coco you're okay with that you're nodding away good uh let's see one more question and i and then i think we might be out of time um uh, but uh, uh this one is also about performance it might have already been answered um this is from vanessa lee uh, can you talk more about how you did the performance benchmarking I think the test was quite simple uh for the first few things we tried i I think this has only started since the 1st of October, since Coco joined the team. So um, basically it's really new, uh, not properly you know, tested in terms of uh, experimental setup and everything, um, early results. But Coco, do you wanna try an answer for this? Uh, yeah, uh, so it's really, really simple. Uh, it, uh, basically the... Uh, uh, the course largely taken from the example in the elixir, uh, numerical elixir, and I just um, change a little bit and add one more layer, and then I um, put the safer time data set, and then I also there are around uh, 16 8, 8k parameters. So it's really, really a small network, but uh, it, so. Um, it's really uh, small and uh, uh, I think this is really, uh, the purpose is to demonstrate that we can do this um, types of machine learning on this small devices. So, and and most of the time you won't need a super large network on this IoT devices. They are, they are, that's not their purpose. Maybe you only need a small network and you can do the job on, on a. Awesome. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, Barbara, do we have time for one more question? Um, I think we do. This is the last session of the day, so there's plenty of time. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, this is from uh, Nikhil. Uh, could we not just trim out the unused parts of the ML library and run our models over those lean libraries? Yeah, I think that's not really. Um, so. Um, I suppose even if you try to just compile down only the code you'd need, uh, like a C compiler would work, right? The C compiler would just take away the pieces you want uh, from the library you're importing and just keep that pure code and port it to your device for this reason, you know, saving memory space. And it still um, would uh, require significant memory to even implement this. Um, so imagine the memory you need for every little neuron and the connections you need between neurons and then the actual steps you need to take in terms of recurring through the whole network of neurons. So all of that has a, a, a big impact on the memory you need to run an algorithm as it currently is, even if you just use the thing you wanted from that library, you'd still need um, a lot more than a, a, an embedded little tiny processor could offer in many cases, right? Um, also, in some cases, just making a small neural network with like three neurons wouldn't put anything out in the output that's useful to anybody. So you need to figure out this kind of balance between um, the architecture of the thing you're trying to port to this device, the accuracy you want to see in the output, what can you sacrifice, what can you not sacrifice? Can you sacrifice a set of layers? Can you, you know, trim uh, neurons that are not contributing? Like you would prune a, a tree algorithm in a way. Um, 
you know, what do you do and why do you do it? And how can we make that into a library that people can, you know, just switch a, a, a button on and off and say, well, I want that optimization for this device or I want the other optimization for that other device that I'm using, you know? I don't think that quite exists right now. <laughs>